Welcome to the Nurse Station. I'm Maria Mobley, and today we are going to learn about respiratory acidosis versus respiratory alkalosis. As always, these videos are for educational purposes only, and please watch the introduction to acid-base imbalances if you haven't already, and it'll really help you understand better, especially when we get to potassium, okay? So, um, I put on the left side of my board really big things you just need to understand about how the lungs helps us in acid-base imbalances. So remember, we have three systems that kick in when we are not in homeostasis, and with our pH, we want it to be between 7.35 and 7.45 to be in homeostasis. So remember, if our pH decreases, that means we have more acid in our body for one reason or another. And if our pH increases, we have more base in our body. And you gotta think about your lungs is the second line of defense that kicks in if we start to go into an acid-base disorder. And also think, the primary ion that the lungs controls in relationship to acid-base imbalances is CO2, carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is an acid, so always ingrain that, ingrain that in your brain because you have to understand, do we have too much carbon dioxide? Do we have too much acid? And then our body is getting more acidic, so our pH is decreasing. Or do we have too little acid? We might not have enough CO2, and our body is getting more alkalotic. Our pH is increasing. So these are golden rules you need to remember related to how your lungs help when we start getting into acid-base imbalances. So if your pH decreases, that means it's getting more acidic, your lungs will start to increase in respiratory rate in depth. And think about it. CO2 is an acid. So if our pH is decreasing and getting more acidic, our lungs are going to start to breathe faster and deeper because remember, we inhale oxygen and we blow off carbon dioxide. So for one, for one reason or another, I'm starting to get more acidic. So my lungs are going to start breathing deeper and breathing faster. And when we exhale, we're exhaling our carbon dioxide off. So we're helping to get rid of acid. And think about the opposite. Let's say we have lost our acid for some reason or another. Um, so how, are, how is our lungs gonna help us? Well, remember our lungs primarily controls the acid. So when we are starting to get more alkalotic, when our pH is increasing, our lungs are gonna slow down their respiratory rate. They're gonna breathe more shallow. Because don't we want to try to hold on to that acid to help our body with an alkalotic disorder, okay? So just to review again, when we are in an acidic state, our lungs start to breathe. So we're trying to exhale our carbon dioxide. We're trying to get rid of more acid to help with the acidic disorder. Because if you're too acidic, doesn't it make sense to blow off more acid, right? And then the opposite, when we're getting more alkalotic, I don't know to breathe more shallowly. If that, I don't even know if that's a word. I don't know to breathe more shallow. But if I could demonstrate that, I would slow down my respiratory rate and I would try to take more shallow breaths because you're trying to hold on to your CO2. You're trying to hold on to your acid because we're in an alkalotic disorder. So golden rules of how your lungs help you cope in acid-base imbalances, okay? So let's talk about respiratory acidosis versus alkalosis. So look at all these causes of respiratory acidosis. I, again, want you to think, think about general patho of your lungs. We inhale oxygen from the outside environment. It goes into our airway and down into our lungs. And remember, your alveoli is what allows gas exchange. So your oxygen goes into what we hope to go into our circulatory tract and spread oxygen to the rest of our tissues, and our CO2 goes into the alveoli as well. Gas exchange occurs, but our CO2 is blown out while the oxygen is used in our body, okay? So any disorder, and I've only listed a couple, any disorder that affects the ability for our lungs to exhale CO2 out will increase acid on our body because remember, CO2 is an acid. So any disorder that can obstruct your airways for one reason or another, Think asthma. Asthma is narrowing an inflammation of airways. Yes, we always, we have to prioritize in Maslow's. 
For asthmatic clients, you want to get those airways open with a bronchodilator and we want to get oxygen on them, right? Oxygen is our priority, but our topic is respiratory acidosis. Think, if we can't get oxygen in, we're not getting CO2 out either. So, asthma, with that narrowing of your airways, it retains CO2. COPDers retain CO2, so they're retaining acid. They're at a high risk for respiratory acidosis. And a lot of these other things, I put a, just a general rule, any condition that obstructs your airway or suppresses ventilation. Again, think about it. We inhale oxygen, exhale CO2. So if we are suppressed with our ventilation, if our inspiration and expiration is greatly depressed, think about your normal respiratory rate, 12 to 20 breaths per minute. Let's say a client had an opioid overdose and their respiratory rate is six breaths per minute. Yes, they're getting little oxygen in, but they're also getting little CO2 out. So they are again retaining that acid. So group it all together. Anything that can obstruct the airway, COPD, um, asthma, pneumonia, uh, bronchiectasis, there's so many disorders that can obstruct the airway. So priority, if your O2 is low, you give them oxygen, but also think they can't get that CO2 out, so they could be going into respiratory acidosis. And then anything that suppresses our ability to breathe. And the, very common, we are in the opioid crisis, are narcotics. Think about any depressant, benzodiazepines, general anesthesia suppresses our ability to breathe. So just group it all together. Anything that does not allow you to um, effectively exhale CO2, which is your acid, could lead to respiratory acidosis, okay? So how are these clients gonna look? It's absolutely gonna be dependent on the disease. You know, asthma, they could have wheezes. COPD ears could have barrel chest and accessory muscle use. So whatever disease is causing the problem, of course, take those manifestations of the disease. And we're gonna have hypoventilation. If they're in respiratory acidosis, they are not exhaling CO2 effectively. So their respiratory rate could be depressed. It could be shallow. Uh, it could be low in breaths per minute, okay? And they can absolutely have hypoxia because if we can't get CO2 out, we probably aren't getting oxygen in effectively. And then typically we see a change in behavior. These are a lot of times causing respiratory issues. So anytime we have impaired ability to get oxygen in, your clients can have a change of behavior. Uh, they can get restless, they can get anxious, they can get confused. So typically a change of behavior occurs, CNS depression, they can be lethargic, fatigued. Just think about anybody that, just think about how a sedated client would look. That's kind of how CNS depression looks in terms of your assessment. And if the body has started to cope, meaning remember those three systems I talked about in that first video, your buffer, your respiratory, and your kidneys. Um, if your buffer has started to work, they've already tried to shift your hydrogen ion into your cell, which is an acid, and bring potassium out. That's why we could have hyperkalemia with respiratory acidosis as well, okay? So, as a nurse, as a medical professional, what are you gonna do to help these clients? And it makes complete sense. Their problem right now is they cannot effectively get CO2, carbon dioxide, which is an acid out of their body. So we have to help them. We have to improve ventilation, okay? So, oh man, I'm good, I wrote it already on the board. The goal is to improve ventilation one way or another. Positioning is humongous for respiratory disorders. We want to sit that head of the bed up. We want them to be inhaling and exhaling effectively, okay? So you want them in semi-filers or high-filers to whatever they can tolerate best. We, of course, may need oxygen. If, again, if we have an obstructed airway and CO2 can't get out, oxygen probably is not getting in either. So oxygen as needed, turn coughing, deep breathing, suction as needed. A reason for airway obstruction could be sputum. Uh, we have clients that, for instance, cystic fibrosis, characterized by excessive sputum. So we need to clear the airways, okay? Um, treat the cause. If it's asthma, you have airway narrowing, airway inflammation. You need to open those airways up as quickly as possible. So we would give them a bronchodilator, such as albuterol. 
If it's pneumonia, let's say they have excessive secretions that's obstructing oxygen getting air in and carbon dioxide from getting out, so they're starting to get acidic. You need to treat that bacteria or that fungus, whatever is causing that pneumonia. So if it's bacterial, we treat it with an antibiotic. So again, whatever the cause is, we absolutely need to treat that in order to open up the airways and effectively get oxygen in and carbon dioxide out. Hydration. Uh, we always want to keep clients well hydrated. Uh, hydration helps to uh, loosen secretions, helps to thin secretions so we can suck them out or they can cough them up more effectively. And then mechanical ventilation. Let's think about this. Clients can be very sick. I, I, we, we haven't even talked about ARDS or um, any respiratory depression that can lead to respiratory failure. All those clients could potentially be in respiratory acidosis. So let's think about it, critically thinking. Mechanical ventilation is when we put in an airway, an endotracheal tube, into their airway. And then we can hook it up to a ventilator and breathe for them, okay? If they have a tracheotomy, we, can, we don't have to use the ET tube. We can ventilate them through their tracheotomy, okay? So the goal of treatment for respiratory acidosis is to improve ventilation, okay? So you walk in the room, and let's say their CO2 is really high. Remember, normal CO2 is 35 to 45. Let's say they had an ABG value that's showing respiratory acidosis and their CO2 is 54. We want to breathe that acid off of their body. So the mechanical, the mechanical ventilator has settings. We could increase that respiratory rate. If we increase the respiratory rate, are we improving ventilation? Are we going to help them blow more CO2 out? Yes. So you need to think anything that will improve ventilation, from sitting the head of the bed up, to giving oxygen, to helping them breathe more effectively. We have breathing exercises we can teach them. You could suction if the airway's obstructed. Always treat the problem, okay? And then mechanical ventilation, if they are intubated, we can adjust our ventilator settings to help blow off more of their acid, more of their CO2. And if we get rid of acid, won't it help an acidic disorder? Okay, so I hope this is helping you. Respiratory alkal alkalosis, the complete opposite. Now the client, for some reason or another, has blown off too much acid. They have blown off so much CO2 that they're now getting into a basic problem or an alkalotic problem. So any condition that causes hyperventilation, think about what hyperventilation is. Again, normal respiratory rate is 12 to 20 breaths per minute. If we are hyperventilating, they are blowing off too much acid. They are losing too much CO2, which is their acid, and then they can turn into an alkalotic disorder. Think about it, when somebody's having a panic attack, you always see in movies or videos, somebody give them a brown paper bag. If they're having a panic attack, they're blowing so quickly, so forcibly, that they're losing their CO2. That brown paper bag, the purpose of it is ever, all the CO2 they're exhaling is going into the brown paper bag and they're breathing it back in. And it's gonna help prevent alkalosis to occur. And it makes complete sense. So any disorder that causes hyperventilation can lead to respiratory alkalosis, all right? So hysteria, anxiety, panic attacks, mental health disorders can lead to respiratory alkalosis. When you are in pain, things are heightened. Your respiratory rate increases, your heart rate increases, your blood pressure increases. We hope to treat clients before they get to that point. But again, if they are in severe pain, they can start hyperventilating. Hypoxia um, can, hypoxia causes is decreased oxygen, and I don't want you to just correlate it with respiratory alkalosis, but if we have low oxygen in our body, how is our body gonna try to cope? We've already talked about it with the rules. We have low oxygen in our body, we're gonna try to start breathing faster and deeper to try to get more oxygen in. But we're hoping to get more oxygen in, but we could be breathing too fast that we're blowing off too much acid as well. So it can lead to respiratory alkalosis. And overventilation by the mechanical ventilator. So again, think about that ET tube in them. It's hooked up to the ventilator. And what if we walked into the room 
and the respiratory rate was set at 30 breaths per minute. It can be, it just depends what disorder they're having. Or for some reason, they were breathing too quickly. The mechanical ventilator was making them breathe too fast. Aren't they blowing off all their acid? And I'm saying all, but do understand they're just blowing off too much CO2. So the mechanical ventilator or over ventilation by the mechanical ventilator, meaning that their respiratory rate might be too high, we may have ventilated them too much, could have made them blow off too much CO2, too much acid, and led them into an alkalotic disorder. So how are these clients gonna look? The, the primary cause of respiratory alkalosis is hyperventilation. So of all things, you can bank on that respiratory rate being elevated, being very high, okay? So they'll have tachypnea, their respiratory rate will be fast, hyperventilation. Um, they can have a change in behavior just like acidosis. When we start messing with our pH, whether it be more acidic or more alkalotic, and remember, these are all respiratory problems at this point. You can absolutely have a change in behavior related to either buildup of acid, loss of acid, or even just related to maybe they have a lack of oxygen in their body. So you could see restlessness, agitation, confusion. CNS excitability. Something y'all should group into your head. Remember that first video I talked about potassium influencing acidosis and alkalosis. When we think about acidosis, you should think hyperkalemia. When we think about alkalosis, you should think hypokalemia. And watch that video if you don't understand what I'm saying. But when we think about acidosis, you should also think about CNS depression. Clients to see just their behavior is much more sedated or lethargic or fatigued or weak. With alkalosis, your clients seem to be much more irritable. They can have tetany. They can have tremors. They seem to be heightened. Um, they can complain of paresthesia or all this numbness and tingling. They can um, complain of twitchiness. So just group it together. Again, when you think acidosis, think depression. Their muscles are weak. They are sedated, confused, lethargic. And then with alkalosis, think CNS, central nervous system excitability. They are kind of uh, heightened, um, twitchiness of muscles. Uh, that, that could lead to tetany, uh, irritability, things like that. And then like I said, we've already talked about, watch that first video if you don't remember how potassium is influenced in acid base imbalances, hypokalemia for alkalotic disorders. So how are we gonna treat these clients? Your goal is to decrease the respiratory rate one way or another, because think, when that respiratory rate, when they are hyperventilating, aren't they blowing off all their acid? I am very dramatic. It's not all their acid, but aren't they blowing off excessive amounts of carbon dioxide or acid? So, the clients are looking like this. They're blowing off, they are tachypnic, they're blowing off a lot of CO2. Your goal is to decrease that respiratory rate, okay? So let's talk about how we do that. Breathing exercises. If somebody is having a panic attack, aren't, don't you encourage them to slow down their breathing, to deep breathe, to regulate their respiratory rate. So breathing exercises, calming them down. We already talked about the brown paper bag, but in medical facilities, we don't really pop out our brown paper bag. It's, it's typically and remember, the purpose of a brown paper bag is when they exhale into it, all that CO2 goes right back into them when they inhale. So instead of a brown paper bag, what we use a lot in the healthcare facilities is a rebreather mask. Think of it as the same concept as a brown paper bag. This mask covers their nose and mouth, but it doesn't have any holes to the outside environment. So it's an occlusive mask to the face. We can use this as a means to giving oxygen as well. But a rebreather mask just is occlusive to the face, so if they exhale, CO2 can't get out. It stays in that mask, and when they inhale, they breathe the CO2 back in, which is nice. And also remember, this can be hooked up to oxygen, so they be can begin oxygen as well if they need it. And then CNS, oh, I'm sorry, change in ventilator. Okay, if we are, uh, 
The cause is a mechanical ventilator. If the respiratory rate is too high, for instance, we need to adjust those ventilator settings. We are making them hyperventilate because remember, if they need a mechanical ventilator, we are pretty much breathing for them. So if it is a mechanical ventilator, we need to decrease that respiratory rate. So we need to change those settings so we can bring or help prevent hyperventilation, bring their respiratory rate back down so they're not ex exhaling too much CO2. And then CNS depressants as needed. Think if somebody is having a full out blown panic attack, or if you've ever worked in the emergency room setting and uh, people are combative or coming at this, sometimes we have to give medications to depress them to sedate them. And also think about what sedatives do to your respiratory rate. Don't they bring your respiratory rate down? Let's say we have to give them a benzodiazepine. They're used for a lot of things. They're used for anxiety, for instance. But if we push, for instance, lorazepam, we are gonna help bring that respiratory rate down. So if it comes down to it, we will use CNS depressants to pull that respiratory rate back down so that they are retaining more CO2 or more acid to help with this acid-base disorder. So I hope this really helps you. I hope you can break it down. Remember, key concepts you have to understand before you even dive into this, you have to know how to interpret ABGs. So I have a video up that just shows you quickly using arrows how to interpret ABGs. That is step one because you can't start thinking about how to treat a respiratory acidosis or respiratory alkalosis disorder if you don't know how to interpret ABGs, okay? So know how to interpret your ABGs. And then based upon the symptoms, how the client's presenting, remember in our NCLEX question breakdown, if you have a clearly identified problem, you don't gather any more data as a nurse. You do an intervention, you do an action. So. If you see an ABG value that shows respiratory acidosis, you don't gather any more data in those NCLEX style questions. You need to jump to an action. You need to, for instance, it's respiratory acidosis, you need to improve that ventilation one way or another. You need to pick an action. If you see an ABG that is respiratory alkalosis, don't gather any more data. Don't get an O2 sat, don't get a PaO2, your arterial oxygen level. You already have a clearly identified problem. Don't look for another one if there's no oxygen value. You just need to help fix the problem in that question right here, right now. I want to leave you with the last critical thinking note. You have an ABG interpretation, okay? And remember, you have to know your, val your normal values to be able to interpret ABGs. If you ever see a low PaO2 or a low pulse ox level, so remember, normal pulse oximetry is 90 to 100%. PaO2 or arterial oxygen that is a serum lab value from our blood, normal values are 80 to 100. If you ever see a low oxygen level, critically thinking for NCLEX style questions, who cares about the ABG interpretation? You better fix the oxygen. Your answer is to give oxygen. Your answer is to elevate the head of the bed. So if you ever see a low oxygen level and then an abnormal ABG interpretation, such as respiratory acidosis or alkalosis, oxygen is your priority. Don't try to fix that ABG disorder. You need to fix their oxygen first, okay? So I hope this helps. Um, be on the lookout for my metabolic acidosis versus alkalosis video. And as always, we are better together. This does not have to be hard. Let's break it down together. If you understand this, please help another student so they can be successful on their test as well because we need to get y'all to the bedside, okay? Take care.